I'm supposed to talk a little bit about uh, the death of bin Laden and sort of the future of jihad and, and al-Qaeda and, and where things are going. And that may seem like a, a, a sort of an obvious topic to address, and, you know, given recent events here in May. But I think, you know, if you, that night after Osama bin Laden was killed, after the news broke that he had been killed in, in Abbottabad, Pakistan, I turned on CNN and I saw one of the guys who's considered one of the leading thinkers on al-Qaeda, a guy named Peter Bergen, who's CNN's counterterrorism analyst, say that the, the war was over, that's it, terrorism is over, we don't have anything to worry about anymore, that's it, and in fact, it's just the Americans need to get beyond the war on terror. As if, as if it's something that we came up with, as if it's a construct in our heads and not something that we're actually fighting, you know? So I guess I would start by saying that the war is in fact not over for a lot of reasons. I think that the ideological conflict uh, has been greatly outlined by the previous presenters here today, and so I'm not gonna touch so much on that, but what I'm gonna talk about is much more about the nitty gritty of the fight. And that starts with jihadist sponsoring states. Now, that may even seem like an obvious uh, uh, notation for everybody. I mean, you know, of course there are states that are involved in sponsoring terrorism and involved in terrorism. But in fact, much of the analysis that's proceeded here in the U.S. and in the West starts from the presumption that states aren't, in fact, involved in sponsoring terrorism, whether that be al-Qaeda or its like-minded affiliates around the globe. And since we have a, a Cold War-minded crowd here today, I'll start with a, a brief analogy. Back in the Cold War, back in 1981, in fact, the Reagan administration decided it was going to confront uh, Marxist and leftist terrorism. And Secretary of State Alexander Haig came forward and said, that in fact, much of the terrorism that was on the planet, Marxist and leftist terrorism, was sponsored by the Soviet Union. And so the Reagan administration ordered up a national intelligence estimate on Soviet-sponsored terrorism. And they kicked it over to the CIA's analysts. And the CIA's Soviet analysts came back and said, well, no, in fact, the Soviets aren't sponsoring terrorism. It's against their interest to do so, and they would never do this. They would never be involved in, in sponsoring terrorism. Well, the fight that ensued, a bureaucratic fight that ensued, was quite legendary. In fact, Bob Gates, the current Secretary of Defense, talks about this in his book, From the Shadows, and I would recommend anybody go out there and read it, because it's a pretty interesting uh, characterization of it, I would say, even from Bob Gates, who's you know, ever the bureaucrat and sides of the bureaucrats to a certain extent. I think he still gets the facts right of what happened. And lo and behold, what happened was, the Soviet analysts were wrong, and uh, Bill Casey and the CIA leadership and President Reagan were right. In fact, the Soviets were deeply involved in sponsoring terrorism. In fact, not only were the Soviets and their client states deeply involved in terrorism uh, generally and broadly in terms of training and, and so forth and ideologically, they actually were arming and training terrorist groups in Europe, in the Middle East, and elsewhere to attack us. And in fact, in Lebanon, a Soviet-backed terrorism group was actually tasked by the KGB to go out and kidnap the deputy head of the CIA in Lebanon in the 1970s. So I just want you to pause for a second here and think about this. At the same time that the Soviets are actually sponsoring terrorism against the CIA directly, the CIA Soviet analysts are saying that the Soviets aren't sponsoring terrorism at all. Okay? You know, that's the type of ideological, I would say, intellectual blind spot you're dealing with when it comes to the analysis of terrorism. Now you may be wondering, what does that have to do with today? What does that have to do with al-Qaeda and Islamist terrorism? Well, it turns out that in the 1990s, our analysts, uh, as brilliant as they are, made the same assumption again. They decided that Islamist terrorism, jihadism, was not state-sponsored. And in fact, if you go to the 9-11 Commission report, you'll see in the 9-11 Commission, it specifically describes al-Qaeda as quote-unquote stateless and as a new terrorism without any state backers. Now, if you go through the 9-11 Commission report carefully, as I have many, many times since 2004 when it came out, you'll realize that this is logically incoherent when you actually look at the facts of what's reported in the 9-11 Commission report. Now, I'll start with a very simple, basic overview of just safe haven for al-Qaeda. It starts in the early 1990s when bin Laden and al-Qaeda needed a place to live, and they turned to Sudan, which was at the time run by a guy named Hassan al-Tarabi, a leading member of the International Muslim Brotherhood. And Tarabi was a radical ideologue, a real dangerous thinker. If you actually get into how he thinks and how he viewed the world, it's really, really troubling. And Tarabi did not see the world as, you know, divided, or the Muslim world even, as divided between Sunnis and Shiites. He saw the world as divided between Muslims and non-Muslims. And so what he did with the Sudan was he turned it in basically this, this place for cross-fertilization of all these different terrorist groups and ideologues to come together, and terrorist groups come together, including al-Qaeda and bin Laden. And you know, Osama bin Laden forged a lot of lasting relationships there in Sudan. So his safe haven in Sudan, as documented by the 9-11 Commission, was a crucially important part in al-Qaeda's development. Well, wait a minute, that's, that's one state, right? So we've got one state where we now have one state that actually played a role in sponsoring al-Qaeda. Well, in the mid-1990s, uh, al-Qaeda's safe haven in, in Sudan became uh, troubled, I would say, under immense international pressure. 
And so the Sudan politely asked bin Laden to leave, basically, with al-Qaeda. And what they did was they relocated to South Asia. Now, going to the 9-11 Commission report, what you find is that the Pakistani military and intelligence establishment, which had long had a relationship with bin Laden and al-Qaeda going back to the 1990s, 1980s when it was, when it was sort of proto-al-Qaeda was first getting going, the military intelligence establishment of Pakistan likely knew he was coming when the 9-11 Commission found, and actually took steps to introduce him to the Taliban in Afghanistan to make sure he'd have a safe haven in Afghanistan. Well, that's two states now, right? They're playing a role in sponsoring al-Qaeda. Because now you have the Pakistani military intelligence establishment making sure that al-Qaeda's leadership can relocate to Afghanistan. Now, of course, they get to Afghanistan, and what happens is that the al-Qaeda forges this lasting relationship with the Taliban. Now, you're gonna, there's a lot of nonsense out there about the Taliban could be split from al-Qaeda, and I, I won't get into that today because that's like a whole other session, but that's just not true. But here you have a third state, right? You have the Taliban's Afghanistan now, which is sponsoring or, or working with al-Qaeda. So what does the, the, the paradigm stateless mean? Well, to me, it, it's meaningless. It doesn't mean, mean anything. It basically, it's trying to skirt around the fact that you have a number of bad actors that are really involved in sponsoring, harboring, tra harboring training, you know, variety of le levels of assistance and support for al-Qaeda and its affiliates. And as you, as you go through that, what you realize is that really a lot, when you, when you start to accept the fact that states are involved in this fight, you start to see things a little differently. And I'll, I'll give you a great example. If you look at the fight in Afghanistan right now, um, our military leaders, and I would say our political leadership, goes to great lengths to deny the fact that Pakistan and Iran are essentially waging proxy war against American troops in Afghanistan. They occasionally will admit that, yes, Iran is doing bad things and that Pakistan is doing bad things, but they don't really want to get into the real war as it's, it's unfolding. And there's a lot that could be said about this, but one of the interesting sources that's come forward to really confirm the role that Pakistan and Iran are playing in Afghanistan waging war against our troops are all these leaked documents from WikiLeaks, including the Guantanamo threat assessments, State Department cables, and ISAF threat reports. Okay? Those are three categories of documents that have been leaked by WikiLeaks. Now, I guarantee you when Julian Assange set forth to leak these documents that he did not think that he was going to be talking about state-sponsored terrorism or he was going to be documenting what America's enemies are up to. But that's, in fact, what he's done. And as you go through these documents in great detail, you find a lot of troubling revelations. You find, for example, as I did back in 2002, the Pakistani ISI, the same group that introduced bin Laden to the Taliban back in the mid-1990s, has actually been working very heavily with all the different insurgency groups in Afghanistan, trying to bring them together and coordinate their attacks against Americans and even civilians. In one case, this is really, really troubling from my perspective, uh, in one case, they actually trained the Taliban to go after civilian uh, workers in Afghanistan, including Red Cross workers. And the Pakistani military officers trained the Taliban to go into Afghanistan, kidnap and murder a Red Cross worker, which they did. Okay? And in fact, they were relaying instructions for once this guy was kidnapped, this poor victim was kidnapped, the Taliban actually got on their satellite phones and relayed to, to get instructions in Pakistan for what to do with them. And the order came from the Pakistani-supported Taliban leaders in Pakistan to kill them. Okay? Well, that's state sponsorship, isn't it? I mean, that, that's a state you know, directly sponsoring jihadist terrorism. And it gets worse than that. I think if you go across the board, you can actually see that Pakistan has basically become the home for all three of the chief insurgency groups that we're fighting in Afghanistan today. You have, you know, Gilbert and Hikmatir's group, which is known as the HIG. You have Mullah Omar's Taliban, which, by the way, is located in Quetta. In fact, the head, his, his group is called the Quetta Shura Taliban. Okay, hello. It's named after a Pakistani city. We all know where he's operating. You know, the Pakistanis know where he's operating and protecting him. You know, the Haqqani Network, which is the third main insurgency group, longtime clients of the Pakistani military intelligence establishment. In fact, the head of the Pakistani military has repeatedly tried to negotiate a power sharing agreement for Siraj Haqqani, the head of the Haqqani Network, in Afghanistan. That's how much they're under the patronage of the Pakistanis. Well, so it's indisputable that these three groups are all originally Pakistani proxies. It's indisputable that they all receive support from Pakistan to this day. In fact, I could list hundreds of examples of how that's true. But there's something else you should know about all three of them, which is that they're all deeply allied with al-Qaeda. Okay? So al-Qaeda, you know, is not just this group that's stateless as the 9-11 Commission found, but actually has both direct state backers, but also indirect state backing through the groups it's allied itself with, which are in turn state backed. And so, you know, I come back to what uh, what's been said about, you know, Peter Bergen saying the war on terror is over, and you're going to see a lot of people, I think, thinking along those lines. But I come back to where Osama bin Laden was killed, which is basically right near Pakistan's version of West Point 
in Abbottabad, Pakistan. Now, if you think that nobody in the Pakistani military and intelligence establishment <laughs> knew that, didn't know that he was there, I would say I've, I could take you up to New York and there's a bridge I would like to sell you. You know, because it's just not true. I mean, I, obviously, you know, in fact, the Obama administration went to great lengths to keep the operation from the Pakistani military and intelligence establishment because it was so worried about this information being leaking and the raid being stopped. It turns out, again, turning back to the 911 Commission, that's not new. In fact, when the Clinton administration tried to kill bin Laden back in 1998, they decided against it. Why? Because they'd have to tell the Pakistanis that they were coming, and they knew the Pakistanis would tip them off. Right? Well, isn't that state sponsorship? You know. So where are we when we're talking about stateless? I, I have no idea at this point. I mean, I look at what what's been said about Al Qaeda and its affiliates being stateless, and just the basic facts of how it operates, where it receives safe haven, undermine that whole that whole mantra. But I, I'd like to turn now to Iran a little bit, and this is a topic which I was actually at APAC on Monday discussing. I was supposed to have a debate, but my debate partner dropped out, unfortunately. That would have been fun. But, uh, but Iran, Iran has been one of the more misunderstood uh, parties in all this. And the big misunderstanding from Iran's perspective, from the perspective of people who study Iran, is that somehow, because it's Shiite, that it can't possibly work with Sunnis, okay? And that the Iranians couldn't possibly work with Sunnis because of these ideological and theological differences preclude them from working together. Well, a, a lot of things they can say about that, but I'll start with the 9-11 Commission report, okay? And I would encourage you to go home, if you have a copy of the 9 Commission report, you can, if you want to take down these page numbers, so you can check me, okay? It's pages 61, 68, 128, 240, and 241. And after reading those pages, I want to ask you a question. Does Iran sponsor Al-Qaeda or not? Because I think the answer is unequivocally yes, it does. And it does in very important and very troubling ways. And so, but how can that be, right? I mean, you know, Iran is Shiite and Al-Qaeda is Sunni and they have all these supposed differences. Well, the bottom line is that a lot of times tactical necessity trumps those ideological or theological concerns. And, you know, one of the, uh, I think it was uh, Stephen here earlier had Sayyid Qutub, a picture of Sayyid Qutub throughout his presentation a number of times. And Sayyid Qutub is, in fact, the big Muslim Brotherhood ideologue who influenced and really was the forefather of Al-Qaeda and really got Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda's thinking, sort of put a place for it in the world. Well, Ayatollah Khomeini, who leads the current Iranian revolution, actually, you know, this is Khomeini, not no, Khomeini. Khomeini, who's the current spiritual leader of Iran, he actually translated Qutub's words from the Arabic into Persian. Okay, he sat down and did this, he, multiple volumes of it. So here's the intellectual forefather of Al-Qaeda, and the current head of Iran actually took the time to translate his words into Persian from the Arabic in order to spread his word throughout Iran. In fact, it's still some of the most read, widely read uh, volumes in, in the clerical establishment of Iran today. So this idea that Sunnis and Shiites can't cooperate is really is, I would say, a, a pseudo-intellectual understanding of the world. It's, uh, it's sort of this veneer people like to pretend they actually understand the Middle East when that's really just not an understanding at all. And, you know, again, if you, even if you look at Israel and Israel's enemies today, Hamas is, has many of the same ideological roots as Al-Qaeda does. Well, it's a radical Sunni who's its chief state backer, Iran. Okay. Now, why is this all important? Well, if you go and you check those pages from the 9-11 Commission report, you'll find some troubling things. And one of the things you'll find is that in the 1990s when bin Laden was in the Sudan, he was really struggling to get Al Qaeda going. He wanted to show he wanted to show how Al Qaeda could be, you know, some this international vanguard for jihadists jih uh, around the globe. He wanted to really inspire them to action, and so they needed a spectacular event. They needed something that would show, you know, just how powerful Al Qaeda had become. And Bin Laden got the idea. This is going back to the early 1990s now. That in fact he should reach out to Iran and its chief terrorist proxy Hezbollah for training, and he said. You know, one of the things that Iran did back in the early 1980s, in 1983, in Lebanon, was basically force the American withdrawal from Lebanon with an attack on the Marine barracks there, killed 241 Marines. And bin Laden looked at that and said, ah, well, America's a paper tiger, they will treat if we hit them. And the way I can show people that we can do this is if we learn how to do this, and Al-Qaeda does this to the Americans again. So he, he reaches out to Iran and Hezbollah and he says, show me how to do this, show my organization how to do this. Now, this, this, again, this is all according to the 9-11 Commission report on the pages I cited for you. Okay. Iran and Hezbollah agreed, okay, and they took the military committee members of Al-Qaeda, they took uh, a number of different tactical experts from Al-Qaeda into Lebanon and Iran and showed them how to do it. They showed them how to attack embassies, how to build suicide truck bombs, how to do that type of thing. Well, the result was the 1998 embassy bombings in Kenya and Tanzania. Okay, as you go through that operation, that was a mirror image of what Hezbollah and Iran did in the early 1980s in Lebanon. <laughs> They attacked diplomatic facilities with suicide truck bombs. They were simultaneous attacks. They were coordinated even though they were hundreds of miles away. The way the truck bombs were designed, the whole nine yards. 
So you go forward to 1998, and after the, the embassies are bombed, the Clinton administration sits down and says, well, now we have to really get tough with Al Qaeda, and we're going to issue an indictment. So that's basically what they did. They issued an indictment. Uh, and you look at the indictment of Al Qaeda, and interestingly enough, in the indictment of Al Qaeda, they recognize state sponsorship. They say that Al Qaeda has forged these relationships with the Sudan, as where they were headquartered in the early 1990s, but also with Iran and Hezbollah to act against their common, common enemies. And then you flash forward to October of 2000, when a, a key uh, Osama bin Laden lieutenant decides to, just to agree to a plea deal in the U.S. court, actually in the Southern District of Manhattan. His name is Ali Muhammad. And in his plea deal, he, agreed, he says, yes, I was the one who was personally responsible for setting up the meetings between Hezbollah and Iran on the one hand and Al Qaeda and Osama bin Laden on the other. And he agrees to this. And then in early 2001, there's a trial. And at that trial, several witnesses come forward that are all relied upon by the Clinton administration and prosecutors. And they all say, up and down, that Iran and Hezbollah trained Al Qaeda to do this. And that's how, that's how Al Qaeda required what the 9-11 Commission later deemed the quote unquote tactical expertise to do the embassy bombings. Now think about it for a second. This is Al Qaeda's most spectacular attack prior to 9-11. This is the thing that brings them, this is what brings them into the fore. Most people hadn't even heard of Al Qaeda before the August 1999 embassy bombings. The whole point of them was so that you would hear about them, so you know who they were, that they could kill on a mass scale. And yet, the 9-11 Commission, court Clinton, Amer Clinton administration prosecutors, you know, court documents, the terrorists themselves, a number of different parties have come forward to tell you that Iran and Hezbollah actually showed Al Qaeda how to do this. Well, how can the 9 11 Commission, in the same document that says that Al Qaeda is stateless, include this information on the pages I gave you? It just doesn't make any sense, right? It's just logically incoherent. Well, now the last two page numbers I came to were 240 and 241 I gave you. I suggest you read those very carefully. I have many times because it's actually very interesting. Uh, you'll see that this is, this, these are two pages that were basically written to track the movements of the hijackers for 9-11. And they're tracking their travels. And you'll see seven instances in those two pages where senior Hezbollah operatives and officials are cited. Seven on two pages. Okay. And this information actually did not come, out, come to the 9-11 Commission until one week before the final report was due. And what happens is the commissioners and all their staffers come forward and they say, wow, you know, this is really... This is really troubling. Look at this. You know, they found a box of evidence from the NSA, including intercepts and other information, that showed that Hezbollah officials were tied to all the hijackers. And, they, and the staffers, to their credit, said, we have to put something in the commission's report for this. And they said, we have, we have to do this r real quick because, you know, we can't go to press and publish this report and not explicitly raise the troubling questions about Iran and Hezbollah's role in all this. And so they did. And so 240 and 241 of the pages where they put it in. And you'll see at the end of page 241, when they get to the end of the section, it says, we believe the U.S. government should investigate this further. That's what it says. Well, I'm here to tell you that investigation never happened. Okay. So years ago, people made this assumption that al-Qaeda was stateless. Okay. There is ample evidence that it is not stateless, that in fact state backers work with it and use it for its own purposes. Right. And yet, there's no will to actually investigate the state backers of al-Qaeda. Even after the 9-11 Commission, the official body that's, that's commissioned to look at this, the, the greatest attack, comes forward and says we should look at it. They still don't do it. Well, last week, uh, there was a lawsuit in New York where the, the commission staffer, her name is Janice Kephart, who actually investigated the hijacker's travels. That's what she was tasked with. She filed an affidavit, and she said, you should have been looking at this all along. And she put in an affidavit in a, in a lawsuit against Iran saying that, in fact, Iran at least provided material support by providing safe haven and safe transit to the hijackers. Okay, that's the minimum of what we know. Um, now, in that lawsuit, I think there's some good information and some bad information, but I think her affidavit stands out as something really important. Well, now, wait a minute. You know, I, I keep harping on this, but just think about this for a second. You know, the entire, I'll tell you right now, I have a lot of conversations with people at DNI. DNA, DHS, CIA, DIA, three-letter acronyms, you can, anyone you can pick, basically I talk to people there, okay? Um, and they have this whole idea that stateless, Al-Qaeda is stateless and doesn't get any, doesn't get any state support. And yet here there's this voluminous amounts of information that says otherwise. Well, I want to return to Afghanistan a little bit because here's another great example of where state sponsorship matters. Uh, prior to 9-11, the Taliban and Iran were at each other's throats. There's no, no doubt about that. In fact, in 1998, 1999, they were on the verge of war. And that's because the Taliban executed a number of Shiite diplomats in mazar -e sharif which is in the northern part of Afghanistan, and also had a brutal assault on hundreds of other Shiites there. 
And the Iranians moved a bunch of troops to the border, and Mullah Omar had a bunch of anti-Iranian rhetoric, and the Iranians went back at Mullah Omar, and just, you know, a lot of verbal fighting, rhetorical fighting, and they were on the verge of real fighting. Well, after 9-11, something interesting happened, which the Iranians said they don't dislike the Taliban that much anymore, because we're there. We're in Afghanistan. And so there's a guy down in Guantanamo. One of the things I study intently are the Guantanamo detainees and sort of their profiles and who they are. There's a guy still down there named Kara Karula Kerkwa, his name is. He was the governor of the Herat province for the Taliban, which is the westernmost province borders right on Iran. And he's admitted that what he did after 9-11 was he set up the meetings between the Taliban and Iran so that Iran could give support to the Taliban in their war against the U.S. And Iran pledged its assistance to the Taliban in its war against the U.S. What does that tell you about state sponsorship or state backing? You know, it tells you that Iran is willing to work with anybody against us because, after all, we're the big Satan and the little Satan is Israel. This is what I always tell people. You know, and Iran is basically willing to you know work with anybody along those lines. And so, what you find in the documents down in Guantanamo and all these other leaked documents I talked about, the ISF threat reports and the ISF uh, state, state or the State Department cables, all these leaked documents, is that in fact uh, Iran has sponsored the Taliban through all the years since then from late 2001 through current. Now, of course, the Pakistani ISI does as well in Afghanistan. But here's the Taliban, which is our prime enemy in Afghanistan in terms of what's launching attacks against the civilian population and against American forces. And it's got two very powerful state backers. So, you know, here's, here's the bottom line. If you're an American soldier or American commander or a general on the ground in Afghanistan, who is it you're fighting? You know, are you fighting these stateless actors who are just coming your way, who are waging jihad against you, or are you fighting proxies of states who are, you know, killing American soldiers? And I'll tell you that the evidence is, is just overwhelming that, in fact, it is, these are proxies of states, that they work with states. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily that al-Qaeda or, or its affiliates were, you know, wholly owned by states. That's not, the, that's not the truth, okay? And it's not that they were totally under direct control of states. That's not the truth either. But states have worked with them to amplify their capabilities and have worked with them to achieve common objectives. That's the truth of the matter. And there's a lot of different states along those, those lines. I'll give you another quick example outside of South Asia. If you go to, if you go to Yemen, Al Qaeda and Iran Peninsula, we all know Al Qaeda and Iran Peninsula is now, you know, as according to the Obama administration, the greatest threat to us in terms of terrorism, okay, in terms of Al Qaeda, Al Qaeda affiliates and Al Qaeda itself, because it's the one that's actually taking the lead in launching attacks against us. Well, again, here's a piece of information that comes out through all the leaked documents. The number two player in Yemen is a guy named General Ali Mohsen al -Amar. He's a guy who brought President Saleh to power in 1978, part of a tripartite agreement between basically Saleh's backers, the Islamists, and the military. Now, Ali Mohsen al -Amar is, in fact, according to State Department cables and according to leaked intelligence documents, a longtime supporter of jihadism and terrorism. And in fact, he's a longtime supporter of Osama bin Laden. So this is the number two guy in the military, or number one guy in the military, but number two guy in all of Yemen who's a prime al-Qaeda backer. If you think about that for a second, here's another state that, in fact, or elements thereof that's sponsoring al-Qaeda. And in fact, General Ali Mohsen al amar actually founded or helped found the original al-Qaeda affiliate in Yemen. It was called the Islamic Army, Army of Aden, which grew into al-Qaeda's al -Qaeda's formal affiliate and helped launch the USS Cole bombing and other things. Oh, well, USS Cole bombing. The guy who executed that's down at Guantanamo. Leaked documents on him show that, in fact, he had a great relationship with the Yemeni political security organization in, in the government of Yemen and worked closely with them, a guy named Nashiri, and he had ba state backers there to help him do that. Well, wait a minute now, now we've, now we've tied another government, another jihadist sponsoring state to Al-Qaeda and an Al-Qaeda attack. So what's the common theme of all this, if you hadn't guessed, is that the stateless paradigm doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and that we really need a different way of viewing these things and a different way of talking about them in order to try and understand the enemy we fight. And that the war, as Peter Bergen said, is not over. It's just beginning, I would say, in some ways, because these states have been basically held unaccountable for all this stuff for all these years. And so all the, ide all the ideological problems that, you've talk that were talked about earlier today, I think, are all hold, and I think it was brilliantly outlined for you by the other presenters. I'd say the other half of that are the jihadist states that actually sponsor that ideology in various ways. And they use it for their own gain. They manipulate those who, who, who adhere to it. And they basically, as far as our own government is concerned, aren't even in that game. Thanks.